I want to start today's episode off by clarifying one major thing. I actually hate most MMORPGs. The closer to vanilla WoW you are, the closer you are to absolute garbage in terms of game design. And trust me, I've played a lot of them over the years. Fly for Fun wasn't fun. Mabinogi was more like Mabinopgi. Black Desert Online, okay, I don't have a stinging one-liner for that particular Korean pay-to-win sweatshop, but my point is most MMOs are terrible by design. And yet, here I am, hours upon hours into my Final Fantasy XIV character, when my good buddy Dutaku casually observes that I should really talk about this game. So I said, yeah, all right. Greetings, everyone. This is the Hipster Snack, bringing today a snack suite of a game that I have sunk more time into playing than I am frankly all right with openly admitting. Probably pretty close to Warframe links at this point of time, if we're being perfectly honest. Anyway, launching in its current iteration in 2013 and getting an expansion every two years subsequently from launch, Final Fantasy XIV is one of the most storied games I think I've ever seen. But I actually only started playing when the Stormblood expansion was new, so I'm probably among the least qualified to talk about this game's history at any real length. I can, however, talk about the game in its most current iteration, or at least the one as of this writing. The game opens with you picking a server and creating your character, obviously. As of note, if you're starting the game in the demo version or only have the base A Realm Reborn game installed, you're not going to have access to all the races that are presently available. Just a thing that you should know. However, you make your character, name them, pick some little details like their deity of choice, which no longer has mechanical effects on this build of the game, and you're then prompted for your next major choice. Your starting class, and by extension, your starting major hub city. There are three of these. There's Limsa La Bamba Vista, where entirely too many AFK players gather around the market and drag the game's frame rate to a crying, screeching halt, and where some pretty cool jobs are like Thief and Marauder. There is Hippieville, which is constantly covered in a cloud of vape fumes and is home to a paradoxically good job choices like Lancer and Conjurer. And lastly, the objectively correct choice of Ulda, named because if you asked any rational person if it's the best starting place in the game, they'll respond Ulda. Ugh, that was forced even by my standards, I'm sorry. You'll start there for jobs like Pugilus and Gladiator. Funny enough, those last two were the starting jobs for Ditaku and myself, respectively, and more on that in a little bit. Alright, I'm going to try to do a plot synopsis here, but no small part of this is stemming from memory that's spotty for reasons I'll get to later. However, there's an evil force of generic smoldering villainy invading from the north called the Garlean Empire. They're the resident bad guys for now and forever. The Garleans, fed up with the collective hippy-dippy-lovey-dovey-just-say-no attitude of resident good guy land Eorzea and her people, they decide they don't want to miss a thing and just drop a giant red meteorite moon atop the world which was so devastating it made it so you can't play that storyline anymore. To protect the main character and their main character powers, ancient sage Lewis Swag, or however you're supposed to say that, warps you five years into the future at the low, low cost of all your gear, levels, and items. That is, unless you actually played 1-0, in which case you have my deepest condolences and your items to your name. Thus our game begins in the back of a cart, heading for your starting town. Or the back of a ship if you're going to an inferior town, just saying. Graphically speaking, it's a Squeenix game, of course it looks good. A lot of care was put into this world, and it shows. Even if the graphical engine does come from 2013, it still looks better than some of its more modern contemporaries. Sure, some of the textures do look a little stiff in places, and there is some clipping, but on the whole, it's really quite astounding. In combat, I tend to have my camera way out to watch out for telegraphed AoEs. I play Dragoon a lot, so I'm... yeah. Really, the only complaint at issue in terms of appearances is that in really brightly lit zones, and if there's a lot of enemies, said AoE telegraphs, bright yellow or orange zones, all tend to blend together and it can be kind of difficult to see them. But that is rare and really won't happen in most places. Overall, a very nice visual treat for the eyes, particularly in later expansions. And from an audio standpoint, if you like Final Fantasy music, you're going to enjoy the music in 14. Several recurring themes return as well, such as the level-up fanfare or the chocobo theme and many others. In several themed instances, you'll also get to hear remixes of things like the fight songs from Final Fantasies 1, 3, 5, and 6, and others I'm probably forgetting on top of that too. Not to say that the original stuff isn't good, it's great, 
I particularly like the vocal tracks. Special shoutouts going to Lakshmi's Beauty's Wicked Wiles and Good King Magomag the 13th theme, May His Palm Glow Forever Bright, and the original composition, Dragon Song. Be it remix of the old or in with the new, you'll probably enjoy these songs too, particularly if you're already a fan, but I can't say I'd blame you if you muted the game in favor of your own playlist once you hit up the MSQ roulette for the 100th time. Speaking of, speaking! This game is voice acted during its most pivotal, plot-worthy moments. And I gotta say, Final Fantasy really does get the AAA treatment. Everyone does a fantastic job. There is a lack of continuity, however, as certain characters like Alphano, for example, get totally different voice actors in the expansions than they had in Realm Reborn. That's a nitpicky, what can you do? People have lies and can't wait two years for expansion pack to reprise roles. So, on to the gameplay. Remember that stuff about your class? That will determine your role from one of five basic niches. Melee DPS, range of DPS, caster DPS, tank, and support, with standard party composition being two of those DPS roles, a tank and a support. When all is working in harmony, these four heroes banding together ensures the survival and progress of all. I'll abstain from making a dark joke at this expense as, paradoxically speaking, Final Fantasy XIV has a weirdly cool fanbase. And I've actually quite an impressive listing of people who I call upon in times of need and vice versa. All in all, it's been a shockingly positive experience online provided you avoid one or two particular raids. It's really something else. I guess Final Fantasy fans are just better stock than Warcraft ones. Anyway, you'll get in your starting class and, after playing for a time, gain the ability to class change merely by swapping whatever weapon or tool is in your hand at the time. Oh, speaking of, it's not just going to be combat classes. There's also jobs of the land, like miner or botanist, which collect stuff, and jobs of the hand, like culinarian and blacksmith, which process raw goods into usable end goods. So you want to log on and not immediately fight to the death? You have your options open. To say nothing of side distractions like the Manderville Gold Saucer, full of triple triad matches and chocobo racing, a minigame I admittedly have spent an excusably long time playing. No matter what mood strikes you, there's something to do every time you visit Eorzea. Sure, there's that pesky story campaign you could be following in order to see how your movements in the world impact the socio-political scene, and yes, this does unlock more dungeons and trials and boss fights and greater intrigue, but hey, sometimes I just want to take a break and ride my giant yellow ostrich around for a few hours. Is that so wrong? Alright, it's kind of time for a personal story now. I first played 14 when Stormblood was decently new, like I said. So I made a Rogadin gladiator as I wanted really badly to become a paladin because, well, that's just how I do. I stuck with the class exclusively until the low 40s when I realized I wasn't having fun. It was a slog. I hated the class and people's expectations of me as the tank were pretty crushing for a newcomer. So I rage quit. Not particularly a nice way to say it, but that's how it happened. It was over a year later, post the launch of Shadowbringers, that Ditako convinced me to give it another shot. I used a Fantasia and rebuilt my character anew without losing her progress and made a Viera, who immediately traded her sword and shield in for a lance. Soon I was a Dragoon and marching through not just a Realm Reborn's exhaustive in-game marathon of an epilogue, but was soon walking through the gates of Ishgard and beyond. I found it so much more fun to swap between classes as needed rather than limiting myself, and eventually I found that Warrior was more of the tank role for me than Paladin ever could have been. In part, this is my own fault for being stubborn, but also the game has undergone some massive quality of life changes that make playing these roles infinitely better. I must say I do not miss that TP meter one bit. See, in combat, your character will auto-attack once a fight kicks off, but the real damage and utility of any given class will come in the form of their skills. They'll be given class-specific skills, which will give them what makes them distinctive, like how Gunbreaker has a combo that builds up cartridges that a different, stronger combo expels in turn, and there's also role abilities, broadly broken up into the five aforementioned categories, giving each supplementary abilities that work in broad range of circumstances. And there's a lot of fiddly bits too, for people who prefer some technical crunch. Dragoon and Monks have directional attacks, ones that do more damage if they hit the enemy's back rather than anywhere else. Casters have to plant their feet for their cast times, and all tanks have tanking stances which help them draw aggro. It's a system that rewards both experimentation and taking the time to learn the nitty gritty of what it is your role does. Moral of the story, there's something in Final Fantasy XIV for everyone. Your choice in favorite classes is not just an inbuilt personality test, but what you'll bring to the party on top of all that. 
Mine's Dancer, for example, so I'm a semi-DPS that has some support elements built in, even if my personal damage is a bit on the low side. But I also really enjoy Scholar, Warrior, Red Mage, and Dragoon. And I strive to master each and always be able to bring something to the table. Don't like a particular class? Change it. Yeah, the game is undeniably grindy, but it's vastly superior to many alternatives, as things like the daily roulettes have experience payouts that scale to wherever your character is. There's deep dungeons, fates, quests galore, and the main story campaign to help build your character and experience more of the world around you. Are there things I didn't like? Sure, as I said, it is grindy, and if you decide to pick up a fresh level 1 class when your main has already cleared the first expansion, it's going to be a time investment. Not an unreasonable one, as said, but you will be working for your results. Second, there are plenty of spots where the plot will just come to a near halt. The A Realm Reborn epilogue is so infamous that, once as a sadistic social experiment, I went to the crowded limbs and marketplace and said in the chat, Pray, return to the waking sands, and no fewer than seven people cried out in agony in response. The PTSD is real and tangible. Also, uh, anything having to do with Alamigo. Third, and this is a case by case thing, but I've seen a lot of people salty that you don't really have any choices to make and all your dialogue options, when prompted, which is itself a bit in the infrequent side, don't really matter. The plot proceeds apace anyway. But that's just JRPGs in a nutshell, so that didn't really bother me. But I've heard enough people bring it up as a gripe that I figured I should just let you know that going into things, you're still playing a Final Fantasy title. A basically linear JRPG where your choices are more often than not, which of these would you rather do first, more than which of these would you rather. But I mean, I cut my teeth with RPGs back with Final Fantasy VI, or what we thought at the time was three. So this doesn't really inhibit my enjoyment at all. And lastly, the game is not above giving some bosses and dungeons really terrible gimmicks. This is compounded by the usual disposition of the hardcore raid scene, which I've already commented on in the past, and how if you don't know the raid, they'll ignore you at best and harass you at worst. Though technically, I can't fault the game for that, as that is part and parcel of the genre. But let's get down to what really matters now. Is this game worth the cost of buying the full game and its subsequent monthly subscription fees. No. No, it isn't. It's worth all that, and purchases made in the Mog Station for me to glam my Warrior of Light to the brim and then some, getting two-seater mounts, fun outfits, minions, and more. There has not been, in the time since I picked up the game again with fresh eyes, that a week has gone by that not at least one day of that time frame wasn't spent in the game in some fashion. It is absolutely worth it especially if you've been a fan of Final Fantasy over the years. If you're not, it's not a bad jumping on point either. But if you don't like tendencies often found in JRPGs or MMORPGs or even Final Fantasy as a whole, this is not the game that will make you see the light, as it were. So this has been the Snack of Light, bringing to you another Snack Suite. If you liked today's episode, be sure to tap the like button so I know. If you want more like this every week, you can hit that subscribe and bell icon too. Leave a comment below on which class is your main. I'd love to know. And for more from me and my closest bros, hit up the Tomodachi Bros podcast, both in Podbean and YouTube formats for your convenience. And you can join me right here every week from our obscure reviews and indie excellence. And I will see you there.